Um, so thank you for coming to this session on uh, landscape planning and mental health, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, some of you may know me, um, a professor at Trinity College. I'm a joint appointment in neuroscience and psychology, and my PhD is in biology. Um, I've been doing biomedical research for more, most of my career, um, but I was also working in environmental kind of issues on the side. And at one point, I just started moving those closer and closer together. And one way that I did that was in a research uh, fellowship at Harvard called the Charles Bullard Fellowship. And that fellowship had two goals. One, to look at the quantified research uh, that uh, was published on how do forests protect our health, particularly our brain health. And my other goal was to try and understand where are these natural areas that people can count on for their health and their brain health? Places that people can fall in love with, that you can go to with your kids and go back over and over again, and hopefully they can come back with their kids later. Um, I'm also a member of the Pinchot Institute for Conservation. Um, interestingly, I live in Simsbury, and Gifford Pinchot was born in Simsbury. So there's been a long history of conservation in Simsbury. And I'm going to center my comments today around my role in Simsbury on the Simsbury Open Space Commission. And what we've tried to do is a strategic plan to try and, uh, try and um, sort of think about our landscape for all the different values it needs, including mental health. Um, at Trinity, we are coming up on our bicentennial this year and on the tri-chair of the PLACE subcommittee which is trying to look at what's our place and how can we best take care of where we are in Hartford and welcome the community to our campus. Um, and I'm also a member of the Science and Technology Working Group of the Governor's Council on Climate Change. And as part of that, I've really tried to think about all of these community and land and climate and biodiversity issues from a really interdisciplinary perspective. That's what we need to find optimal solutions to our challenges is to get people from different disciplines all thinking about how to solve them in the most honest and beneficial way possible. So with that, I'll just say that people will often tell me, you do so many things. It's all the same thing, all the same thing. So I just want to impress that upon you. Um, and then you'll think I'm a crazy person because of all these things. So um, here's my research at Trinity. Um, I've been fortunate to have very generous funding from the National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation. Um, my work at Harvard was a collaboration between Harvard Forest and Harvard Medical School, particularly uh, Dr. Stephen Schachter, who's an expert in forest botanicals and has done a lot of research on epilepsy. And I'm now on their board for this major blueprint uh, neurotech grant that they're working on. Um, I'm a proud member of the Grange, and I'm pleased to say that some of my fellow Grangers are here today. I love the Grange. If you ever want to talk about the Grange, please ask me. I'm the county coordinator for the Old Growth Forest Network. We have a table downstairs. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that during my talk. I was one of the kind of key members, and I'm now the spokesperson for Keep the Woods. We saved a forest on top of our drinking water aquifer in Simsbury. That's now part of our Natural Area Stewardship Program. I helped to start the Safe Roots to School Program so kids can walk and bike to school um, and not have to uh, be on a bus and we've developed trails where hundreds of kids could walk or bike to school and never have to cross the street. Um, and finally, I'm kind of the, you know, informal sort of shepherd faculty member for a community garden in Hartford on 1300 Broad Street, Trinfo Cafe, which has just been a wonderful opportunity to kind of share so many different things with the community. But my main point in all of this is that landscape planning is fundamental for climate, biodiversity, and health. If you're in a land trust or are involved in any land-related work, you know this is true. And I'm going to focus on the health component today, but all of these things really come together. And I think that that's something we need to think about. There's a, a little, really old piece of paper uh, stuck on the kitchen wall on our Grange, and it says basically, in essentials, unity. And we all have to get together to realize that we need these green and blue ribbons of water and land to keep our mothership running. This is not optional. 
And so my take home message is that we need nature. We need natural processes that are evolving, that are adapting, that are on their own program because there's so much we don't know. And as a neuroscientist, I'm really blessed to, to have that perspective because I know there's so much we don't know about brains. I've been working on them for decades and so have a lot of other really smart people. And I can tell you, we do not even know how one cell works, literally. That's not an exaggeration. So there's so much we don't know. And these natural processes uh, have evolved over millions of years. Forests evolved before dinosaurs. We also, of course, need healthy brains. Because if we don't have healthy brains, we can't do this kind of interdisciplinary decision making to optimize what we're doing and make compromises where we need to and make strategic decisions and wisely use our resources. So these two things, I've boiled my entire life down to two topics, and these are them. Um, you may be aware, and this is the only bummer slide in my talk, because I like to be positive, um, but you may be aware that like, we have a mental health issue going on. Um, we all do, and it's worse in our kids. Um, you know, there have seen headlines, you know, the kids are not all right. As someone with young adult children and as someone who works in the college every day and works with young people, this is serious. They're counting on us. And what they really care about are nature and justice. Two things, that's it. So if we're not providing those two things for them, we're failing them and we're making them sicker. Um, and in fact, this is so serious and all the time I've been in uh, biomedical research, I've never seen anything uh, like this declaration of a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. I'll just tell you that we do not have enough services to deal with this problem. Prevention is essential. We need every tool in the preventative toolbox. And nature is one of the most power preventative tools. So I'm just going to share with you what I've been doing in Simsbury. And this is actually uh, something I'm going to share with the Board of Selectmen as part of my Open Space Commission uh, just on Monday night, is to kind of make visible to them what we've been doing over the past few years in the Open Space Commission, because they don't hear from us that often. We don't ask them for anything. We just do our little work. But um, I really want to impress upon them, and I know I don't need to impress upon you, that open space is the foundation of community well-being. And I almost, I put open space in quotes because I don't really like that term. It sounds like it doesn't have any use or it's, it's like, what are we gonna do with it? Just being there as natural land is helping everything. So there's so many types of open space in Simsbury. And what we're trying to do is make it visible to people what we're doing where and why. And if it's public land, everyone should have the right to know what that is and why. So one of the uh, primary principles is that nature is our lifeline. And there's a scientific consensus that we need to protect a network of nature literally to keep things running. Um, and this is, this is not new news. Um, this, you know, Native um, Americans, indigenous people around the world always had such a respect for nature and had sacred places. Those were often the places where the shamans were because that's where all the full complement of plants and everything were growing. Um, and so water, of course, is essential. So when I say we need natural systems, water is part of that. So I would have three things except for I included water in the natural systems point. Um, I've been fortunate this year to be participating in the Olmsted 200 as part of the Higher Education Working Group. This, uh, we're coming up on Olmsted's 201st birthday on April 26th, and some of you may know that Frederick Law Olmsted was born in Hartford, um, really pivotal in trying to uh, s establish parks and national parks and places for everyone, where everyone could enjoy nature. And what I've realized in looking through his work, which I didn't know a lot about before, is that his primary goal was health and mental health. So this is something that's, you know, absolutely part of our history, and it needs to be part of our future. 
So in order to achieve this lifeline, you need kind of strategic, holistic, interdisciplinary planning. So you can figure out where should you be putting your housing versus where should you be saving as nature preserves? Where are your water races? What's your, what's your best farmland? Um, and making a community someplace that everyone knows and our kids know is thinking about this for their best future, I think is a powerful preventative against depression. And depression is one of the most common neurological issues um, and it has many different causes. And I'm not expecting you to read this, but I'm just pick depression as something that's so common, something that we all maybe move in and out of from time to time that can get more severe um, and refractory to treatment and become a real problem. And mental health problems, mental illness, is one of the most expensive economic uh, health issues worldwide. So I just want to focus on a couple of things that um, make mental health, that, that make depression worse or that can make depression better, so less depression. So everything I put in red are things that are, incre are associated with the increased risk of depression. Urbanicity, living in cities, is associated with the increased risk of depression and more severe um, mental illnesses, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, things that cause oxidative stress and inflammation, so these are proximal mechanisms kind of in your brain, is associated with depression. Air pollution is associated with depression. Climate change, being anxious about climate change is associated with depression. All of these other things are, I just highlighted a few, things that can be kind of preventative or sort of a, um, you know, treatment. So your family and friends, your neighborhood, um, these mechanisms in your brain called epigenetics, which can allow your brain to change over time, like learning. This is how you learn new things. It's also how you develop pathologies, and it's also how you can unwind pathologies, is through epigenetic changes. And one of the other things that's so important is our biodiversity, ecosystems, and natural environments as a buffer against increased rates of depression. Um, I just want to add in Rachel Carlson here because um, I, like many of you, I associated her primarily with um, Silent Spring and toxins, right? But she also had other writings, and um, I just would like to highlight a piece from the sense of wonder. So she wrote about wonder and said, for most of us, that clear-eyed vision, that true instinct for what's beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed and even lost before we reach adulthood. And this is something that we need to think about because if we've lost that, how can we offer that to our kids? We need to get very quiet and think about what we're doing. And what I really like about Rachel Carlson's approach is that she really had this first do no harm biomedical ethic, even though she wasn't trained in public health or medicine or anything like that, and she knew that nature could decrease anxiety and depression, promote creativity and awe, which are some of those powerful, uh, powerful emotions and feelings that promote empathy and cooperation and altruism and diminished ego and all the things that we need to do to, to really think about how we're gonna provide nature and justice to our children and to the future. And I also want to have people think about something called existence value. So existence value is why people would donate money to animals that they'll never see in Antarctica, or tigers, or something like that. People will donate and will support things just because they know they should be there. We should protect these things for, for others or just for their intrinsic value. And this is a really, uh, to me, I did a big public value survey um, people actually will uh, say that they care about natural areas being available to other people at a higher rate than having them accessible for themselves, which is kind of interesting. Um, so this is a super popular, bipartisan, nonpartisan, um, fundamental principle that we all need. And we need to be very explicit about talking about our values, principles, and policies. Because without that specificity, our ecological lifelines are at risk. And so I want to just share with you, this is the full list. You don't have to read that. I consolidated it to these values over here. 
we worked for quite a while, looked through all of our policies in Simsbury to say, what are acquisition criteria for open space in Simsbury? And just briefly, it's divided into these topics, water, ecology and habitat, soils and agriculture, history and culture, beauty and a sense of place, recreation and connectivity. And all of these different values contribute to community well-being. And um, I just want to say this sense of beauty and sense of place were really what Olmsted tagged onto as the values that would help your brain to relax, help people to recover from the stress of being in an urban environment. And he felt it was, uh, I'm going to talk about this more in the session called Why Wild, but help to unbend the stress and uh, negative aspects that, that our lives would put on us. This beauty and sense of place can unbend that. So what we've done so far in Simsbury is we passed our acquisition policy, and we've passed two other policies on our open space. One is called our natural area stewardship policy, and we put this on our natural forests in town. It's on about 5% of the town, and so how we're taking care of them now is like little national parks. Everyone's welcome, we have trails, if we need to do something we do, but there's no chronic intention to manage unless we need to do something. Um, so we kind of call this a uh, evidence-based medicine, basically, for these natural areas. Um, we can deal with invasives if we need to, so I just want to emphasize it's not banning people, it's not banning management, it's just doing what we need to do when we need to do it. And we have a very detailed policy about it. I have it at my table. If anyone's interested, and it's on our website. Um, we spent multiple years with a whole number of different experts crafting this policy. The other thing we established is a farm lease policy on our agricultural land. And what we did for this is we put what we thought was going to be best practice to be protective of the ecology and the soil um, to give farmers longer term leases so they could be more, uh, you know, have more investment in the land because they knew they would be, have it for a longer amount of time. And what we also did is we put a buffer on our water resources. We said, okay, we know that farming and forestry is by right, but if you're doing farming or forestry on our town land in Simsbury, you have to leave a buffer for a riparian area or a vernal pool or wetlands, etc. So since it's our land and our town, we can put a policy like that on it. And one of the reasons why we tried to set up this 5% of town is just thinking about where can people fall in love with and be able to count on. And um, there's so many quotes I could have chosen for this talk, but I decided to just pick a very famous quote from Henry David Thoreau um, from Huckleberries, that each town should have a park or a primitive forest of 500 or 1,000 acres, either one body or several, where basically it's left to let people see what nature does, see what happens. And I'm really pleased that although Simsbury is 30% what's considered open space, we do have this 5% under natural area stewardship, um, and it's actually between 500 and 1,000 acres. I just realized that today, preparing this talk. So, you know, ultimately, what we all really need to think about in terms of landscape planning and mental health is what's the master plan for the land around you, for the place that you love, for your community, and how can you put together a toolkit that works for your community? So the other topics that we're tackling right now that have been swirling for a while, like a UFO, but I'm hoping that it's going to land, is some really serious ecological inventories on insects and on soils and things that we haven't documenting anything on. And this is what I found being the co-chair of the Science and Technology Working Group. We don't even have enough information on these things. We're not, we don't have long-term data collection protocols. This is really important. Science is really important. And how can you know what you're doing if you have no baselines and no control groups? So that's really critical. Uh, we're going to do a bunch of public education on you know, general stewardship, trying to document things and take data, invasives, um, light pollution, probably my most hated topic, and I just want to advertise if you're here at 415, mm. there is a session on light pollution. Mm. Really, this is an escalating issue. Mm. Um, 
And I'd be happy to answer questions about that, but I don't want to derail my own talk about light pollution, but it's really bad. And, and um, you may have heard that Simsbury is kind of the bear capital of Connecticut. We're going to be doing various Bear Smart education programs. Bear Smart is a basically template uh, program that you can apply in any town. So if your town has bears, what you really need to do is think about being bear smart and educating the public about that to try and prevent conflicts. Um, and we're also in the process now of finalizing our policies on native plants, on our mowing, whoops, depending on if it's a pollinator area or a bird area, et cetera, and a strategic plan for our invasives because the more you look into it, you realize the invasive thing you could make it worse if you don't have a plan for follow-up and, and everything. So it's really something to wade into carefully so you're using your resources most wisely. Um, there's the light pollution. That's just to remind you, remind me to tell you how much I hate it. <laughs> um, and the wonderful opportunity that we have um, in Simsbury is we asked um, Homegrown National Park, which some of you may have heard of, is Doug Ptolemy's effort to have people plant natives. Um, and if we do that, the amount of land we have in our just private yards is more than all the national parks put together. We need more national parks, by the way. But this would be, so this is the effort. You can get on the map with the homegrown national park effort. So I, with all this work we've been doing in Simsbury, I wrote them and I said, well, we want to be a hometown national park. Can we just do that? And they were like, well, I don't know. But um, but they did say, you know what? Write a proposal and we'll co-brand your town with Homegrown National Park. So we now have a town logo with the Homegrown National Park logo. And this is an opportunity for our town to say that we're going to advertise this. We're going to say our town is committed to these values. So it's something that your town could ask about as well. Um, I want to say from my back to my biomedical side, um, there was an unprecedented editorial published on September 21st, about a year and a half ago, um, call for emergency action to limit global temperature increase, restore biodiversity, and protect health. And one of the key take-home messages of this editorial, which was published simultaneously in 200 top medical journals, I've never seen anything like this happen before, um, is that nature has not received sufficient attention. But it has to have the right attention. The first thing we need to do is decide what are our critical areas that we're not messing around with, right? Protect, restore, and then figure out what else we need to do. So the first thing is not to operate on the healthy people. And so I think this, you know, I have two topics of my everything, but I think that we can kind of break this down into three boxes. You know, where are we just prioritizing nature as our lifeline? Where are we doing research? Because we need ongoing research. There's so much we don't know. And what are the areas that we're using for resources? And that could be a whole bunch of different, you know, this is a big box of stuff. So all of these things are valid. Um, this is not against anything. It's for everyone. And there are pluses and minuses of each category. So if, you're, if it's a resource area, that's not an area that you're prioritizing natural processes. Um, research could apply into both categories, right? And right now, in Connecticut, and throughout New England, and throughout the United States, we have a few small pieces, but no strategic plan to protect our lifeline. And scientists recommend an intact network of 30 to 50% of our land and water. And as you'll see in a minute, Connecticut, according to international criteria and wildlands categories, it's 1%. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was a tiny bit of bad news, but we're gonna get back to the good news for a minute. The Simsbury has these you know, incredible building blocks. I mean, look how lucky we are to have these four things converge in our town. It's such a responsibility. Um, and it's, all of these are for everyone. Um, you know, our river, the Greenway, National Scenic Trail, and we had the first forest in Connecticut to be entered into the Old Growth Forest Network, a tiny forest in the middle of town, Belden Forest. It's old, and it was donated by two women who intended it to be, it's in the, in the deed and the um, donation, to be in a heavily forested condition in perpetuity. So it was their vision that now there's this beautiful little refuge right downtown, it's on the bus line, it's next to the library, it's next to the Veterans Memorial, 
It's across the street from the supermarket. So it's you know super accessible and it's such a refuge. When you're in there, it's quiet and you feel like you're a million miles away. Um, back to Olmsted for a moment. Olmsted really had this interdisciplinary vision. He had worked as a farmer, as a journalist. Um, he worked for the, um, the soldiers' health during the Civil War. He did so many different things that he brought to landscape architecture when he started designing parks. And it was his uh, report on Yosemite that provided the founding principles for the national park system that is in the Organic Act of 1916 to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife for the enjoyment of future generations. And when he went to Yosemite, he said, this should be protected for two reasons, science and art. I want to say that um, I'm very delighted to announce that the Olmsted mascot, which looks like this, he's called Big Head Fred. Um, he will be traveling to Hartford, first class, um, in honor of his the wrap up of the bicentennial year and um, we'll be making cameo appearances around. If you would like to have Big Head Fred come to your event sometime between April 18th and April 28th, let me know. I might be able to get you on his itinerary. Um, so Olmsted really was what I would call a multi-solver. And this concept of multi-solving is what I've been telling you about, interdisciplinary, you know, working together to find common solutions with multiple benefits. And this was the kind of the cornerstone of the Science and Technology GC3 report, where we put climate protection, ecological integrity, and diverse perspectives and equity at the center of our multi-solving approach, and then all these different values could be um, considered at the same time. So how do you find common solutions that, uh, that uh, address these pr core principles and have other co-benefits? And this term, multi-solving, was developed by Climate Interactive at MIT to try and think of climate uh, solutions that would have benefits now, because they felt like it seemed too far off in the future. You know, How do we have solutions that help us now that are also helping the climate? Um, and the principles of multi-solving is that you need unbiased and interdisciplinary input. You have to kind of put the whole system together. And people cannot be in that system trying to multi-solve based on their conflicts of interest. You have to have ways to diminish conflicts of interest because without that, we are in a system right now where we have traded money for life on Earth. And um, we really need to think about what are the essentials, what are the data and research that we need, how do we think about locally scaled solutions that can help people in every community, in every different type of community. And I was really committed to having a positive, positive report. There's so much doom and gloom. Um, we need positive ways that, that people can take care of themselves and take care of each other. Um, urban green infrastructure is an opportunity for multi-solving. We found that it's underutilized, quantitatively underutilized, considering the benefits of urban uh, green infrastructure. And you can imagine there's all kinds of you know, carbon, biodiversity, flooding, temperature, etc. benefits of using green infrastructure when you can. Um, in particular, in urban areas, large trees are a really important aspect of the landscape. And I think we have insufficient protection for our urban forests and our urban large trees. Um, if you look at this graph right here, um, the take home message is that large trees in urban settings are biodiversity hotspots. And this graph is about birds. So on the x axis is number of trees per hectare. And here's number of bird species. And here is tree size right here. So you can see you get bigger trees, more trees, way more birds. Um, Trinity has an amazing campus with many beautiful trees. And during the pandemic, we weren't allowed to go anywhere. And um, I said, well, let's look at our campus and think about nature and health on our campus. And that, plus a few other kind of previous conversations, led into some projects. You know, I was really struck by this quote um, one of my students had during their presentation, um, final presentation. 
And the take home message of this today is that we worked for quite a long time to document our trees and um, submit an application to become an arboretum. And just yesterday we got notice that we were approved as a level one arboretum. So very exciting. Um, I know, thank you. So you're all welcome and we want to make the campus, it's open to anyone all the time. You can come and see the trees. You'll have, you know, a little map and um, we have some really special trees on campus. So please feel welcome to come. Um, so I want to get back to kids because I might have kind of, you know, not really stuck with this topic, but it was so important to my students. My students would come back to me and say, you know, that was so important that we talked about that. And I'm so glad you brought that up or you let us do that project. You know, can I volunteer for you during the summer? Is there anything I can help you with on this? And um, so I feel like it was really impactful for them. And um, I'm not talking about this in this talk, but I mean, forests in general quantitatively boost the immune system, decrease blood pressure, and decrease um, stress hormones. And a uh, woman that I became familiar with during this kind of surveys of nature and health is um, from India, Pooja Sani, and she published a very important paper where she found that exposure to nature as a child results in increased mindfulness as an adult. Mm -hmm. So we're talking all the time about mindfulness and, and what can we do. You basically create a buffer of resilience when you give children time in nature, a lifelong buffer. Um, that study was done in India. This study was done in the UK, and I found a lot of this research is not done in the US. Um, this talked about benefits of different types of natural environments, um, and looked at 300, and, sorry, 3,500 adolescents, nine to 15 years old, so pre-adolescent, and they divided uh, the landscape into different types of uh, landscape. And green space was divided into woodland and grassland. And what they found is that higher daily exposure to woodland, but not grassland, was associated with higher scores for cognitive de development and lower risk of emotional and behavioral problems. These are not easy problems to address. And as I said, we don't have enough services to deal with the escalating mental health crisis in our kids. And um, I went to testify in the legislature last year when they had a big bill on mental health in children. And you know, I wanted to talk about you know, sleep, starting school later, um, you know, nature exposure, all these different things. But the stories people were telling were so shattering um, of what was happening to their kids now. It's, my friend has a saying, well, it's hard to clean the swamp when you're fighting the alligators, right? And so we have to somehow figure out how to get ahead of this problem. Um, another big study, also in the UK, talked about uh, early life residential exposure. So they were able to kind of code all the kids by zip code, where they were born, what was their tree cover, grass cover, pavement, and then did extensive standardized testing in kindergarten using the early development instrument. And they found <clears throat> on all of these measures, tree cover was the best. Physical health and well-being, social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, communication skills, and general knowledge. Um, in adults, um, the thing that's kind of amazing about nature exposure is it can have short-term benefits and also long-term benefits. And this study, I think, is very remarkable. Um, as I said, um, urbanization increases mental illnesses, anxiety, depression, um, and schizophrenia significantly. And um, this study looked at an area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that's associated with rumination and mental illness. So rumination is negative self-talk that can kind of spiral, spiral you into a bad psychological place. And what they found is that when people walked for 90 minutes in nature versus an urban setting, they had significantly reduced self-reported rumination. So um, there was no difference walking in the urban environment. It was only the natural condition that resulted in a decrease in rumination. And you may think, well, that's self-report. I'm always suspicious about self-report. But they did brain scans. And if you look at the brain scans, the change in blood flow 
in this prefrontal cortex area associated with rumination, they found the same exact thing. You can't fake that. Like, I don't know how I would change activity in my prefrontal cortex if I wanted to, and I'm a neuroscientist, so I don't think, you know, so I found this very, very uh, compelling in terms of evidence about how quickly you can change your brain activity. Interestingly, during the pandemic, I started doing some pilot experiments with my students on heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is the tiny difference between, we were touching my ear because they wore an earlobe uh, monitor, um, tiny difference in variability between each heart rate. So like a drum machine might be exactly the same distance, but a drummer is a tiny difference between each beat. And so that's what this heart rate variability measures. It's a um, kind of a measure of your autonomic nervous system resilience. And the amazing thing is that, and this is one student, but the students were consistent. This is just a, a particularly striking case. We walked around and then we walked into an old forest along the river and this peak coherence um, increased, and this is good, green is good, increased significantly when we went into the forest and decreased again when we went out. And I'm so thrilled to say that this forest that we went in is owned by Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. It's a little trail. They have a little trail by the river behind their property on Sherman Street. They're going to be dedicating this forest into a community wilds program. So it's going to be open to the public and the kind of place that people can count on. And so we're going to have a celebration of that um, in April, uh, hopefully on Fred's birthday, and I'm hoping that Fred can attend. <laughs> um, some other information that may be of interest. Um, during COVID, um, they found fewer COVID-19 deaths in areas which had high rates of forest bathing and forest cover. And um, what they think might have been part of it is looking at the structure of some of these volatile organic compounds um, like terpenes and looking at the structure of the spike protein on COVID that maybe there was some interaction that helped to inactivate it or bind to it. Um, I haven't seen any follow-up on this yet. Um, Linda Tommaso, who's here in Connecticut, uh, just finished her PhD in public health at Harvard. She did some work on nature and health during COVID and particularly looked at a 90 point scale on flourishing. And what she found is that um, the only thing that was worse than being nature deprived was losing your job entirely. So even just losing wages was not as bad as being nature deprived. Oh, a little bit more on terpenes which are really interesting class of molecules and found in you know, mint, rosemary, but also conifers, pines, you know, that kind of smell you smell in the forest. Um, there's evidence for immunological effects, so anti-inflammatory, oncological, specific toxicity to cancer cells, neuronal protection, um, regulation of gene expression, and these molecules are small, fat soluble and abundant. And if you want to get something in your brain and have brain health effects, it's great to have small fat soluble molecules. Um, just some other kind of multi-solvers across the landscape. Beavers are multi-solvers in so many ways. And I'm delighted that we're going to be offering a five part docu-series at my Grange this year on beaver pond wildlife in Southern New England. Um, it's Simsbury Grange, if you want to look it up. We haven't finalized the date yet. But a filmmaker spent three years every day sitting next to beaver ponds in Connecticut and Massachusetts, and it's jaw-droppingly beautiful. Um, it's not just about beavers. It's all the species there. You'll see things you never would imagine, and just trust me on that. Um, well, you don't have to trust me. You can come see the film and see it yourself. It's, it's amazing. Like a frog ate a whole bird, slugs hatching, weird bugs. It's amazing. Um, old growth forests are multi-solvers and are critical for maintaining this library of evolution and, and so many different values. And, and they're, luckily this is becoming more of the conversation, but we have no strategic plan of how to protect our old forests, how to let more forests become old growth forests and be part of that network of nature. And we could have almost lost all of them. It was only Bob Leverett, um, my co-author and colleague, who discovered that there was still some old growth forests here in New England. He found them in Massachusetts, but we have bits in Connecticut. 
and um, they just accumulate so much carbon and so much going on above and below the ground that we haven't even discovered yet. So we really have Bob to thank for putting this topic on the horizon. And if he hadn't realized this, um, we might have cut them all down by now, again. Um, so anyway, these old and old growth forests are really our library of evolution. And there are many unknowns. And I really think of these areas that are protected like national parks, like seed corn. So um, if you're a farmer, you don't eat your seed corn. You don't do experiments with your seed corn. You save your seed corn. And these are like little places that can you know, help us to move forward um, and adapt. Um, I'm proud to be the Hartford County Coordinator for the Old Growth Forest Network. And I thank Dr. Joan Maloof for her vision in starting that. And her goal is to have at least one forest to be protected, to become an old growth forest in every county. And right now in Connecticut, we have um, four forests in the network. Um, here's Belden Forest, the tiny forest I showed you a picture of before. As you can see, it's right here next to downtown. Um, I don't know why Google Maps wanted to highlight Jersey Mike's <laughs> instead of the library, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, so you can see it's right there. Literally, that's Route 10. Um, this is Johnston Preserve in Lyme, um, another forest in there. So you can see there are very different types of forests. There's no criteria about what type can be in it. Um, a really old forest in Hartford is called Goodwin's Wild. And it's a really old floodplain forest in this little oxbow that's part of a larger uh, kind of network on the uh, north branch of the Park River. And oh, down here, outside of view, is that forest at Hartford International University. And a really important vision for Hartford would be to really offer some protection for this kind of thread of nature that's still going through the city. In this area of Goodwin's Wilds, there's an incredible diversity of trees. And there are trees there from before the Revolutionary War. It's amazing. So we have these jewels on our landscape. And if we're not careful about identifying them and making sure we don't run them over, they're really at risk. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But I've thought a lot about what are some of the core elements of a strategic plan for 30 by 30. We have to talk about kind of our literally bedrock things like geology and water, um, critical habitats, the integrity of our ecosystems, carbon accumulation, and you know, other greenhouse gas issues like methane, et cetera. Um, how are we connecting these pieces so that species can migrate as um, we face climate change and other stresses? How are we going to protect the unknown? Um, and how are we going to make sure that we have sufficient agricultural land of local importance? And the UN report was pretty clear that the value of nature must not be overridden by pursuit of short-term profit, or long-term profit, uh, for that matter. And in some cases, we need to just identify things and be patient and use evidence-based medicine. Some of you may know that there are a lot of conditions. We used to like chop off a piece of something or do this. And now sometimes in medicine, we use a term called watchful waiting. It's not irresponsible. It's responsible to keep an eye on something, intervene if there's a problem. But otherwise, you know, you're just sort of like a steward of that. So um, I just want to reemphasize that all of these things are needed. Multi-solving is for everyone. And nature itself offers intervention and prevention for mental health. And if we can apply common sense and science-based decisions, um, that will align with public opinion and fiscal responsibility so we can best mobilize all of our resources and our, you know, sort of our public brain trust and creativity. I don't want to be fighting all the time. I don't know why we have to fight just for such basic environmental protection. It's really frustrating, um, especially when the science is clear. Um, it shouldn't be like that. So if we want to look at Connecticut, um, let's look at New England first in terms of this dashboard that's maintained at the Wildlands and Woodlands site um, that's joint between Harvard Forest and uh, uh, Highstead. And basically, what this land use allocation is saying is that in New England, this is developed land, dark red, unconserved and conserved agriculture, 
unconserved forest, conserved woodlands. Here's the wildlands right here, this little strip right here. Wildlands are defined as tracts of any size, permanently protected from development, in which management is explicitly intended to allow natural processes to prevail with minimum hum human interference, so evidence-based medicine. And it's not banning people, it's not you know, banning any kind of management that's needed, you just need to prove that it's gonna be beneficial so that we're not running around doing stuff. And so if we have a strategic plan like that, we can figure out how to partition this land into more wildlands. Maybe, maybe some of these unconserved forests could become food forests. We, I would say we need more land for agriculture. This makes me really nervous. I mean, this does not seem like a long-term plan for, for agriculture. Um, and then we can fit all the things we need onto the landscape. Here's Connecticut. Here's our, here's our bar, I blacked out the rest of it, but here's our 1% in Connecticut. And so this is just really um, concerning and ways that we can get more wildlands is maybe some of this conserved woodland um, is better, its highest and best use is as a wildland. Maybe some of this unconserved forest is highest and best used is a, is a wildland. So we should decide what are the forests that we need as woodlots, maybe we need food forests, maybe we need research areas, all of these things can fit on this bar, but 1% is not enough. And I just wanna emphasize that this is not irresponsible, it's responsible. Older trees are more resilient to the stresses of climate change, the changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, our trees are cranking right now. Um, and the other thing is that wilderness, so protected areas, have the risk of extinction. So like I said, this is like our library of evolution, and we don't even know, we are still discovering species. So this is the other, uh, you know, protecting the unknown is a critical piece of this, and perhaps the most critical piece. We just discovered 16 new species in a teaspoonful of dirt in Massachusetts like a couple of years ago um, with new techniques, et cetera. This is our repository for new medicines and you know, other kinds of research opportunities. We can't just keep on running stuff over. Um, Boston has had an urban wilds program for 50 years where they said, we want to identify these key pieces of our landscape in the Boston area um, for history and for ecology and for kids and everything. And right now there are 29 properties in that program and they've just said it's a quiet, natural respite within our dense urban setting. I mean, we need to think about, can we expand this program and identify these key pieces? It has a super simple stewardship guide. It basically says, you know, it's basically like evidence-based medicine, but also includes, um, you know, don't throw trash, don't wreck stuff, keep your dog on a leash, you know, super basic rules. Um, and so back to Olmsted, you know, he really wanted this nature across the landscape for everyone. So that's why I brought up both urban wilds and national parks. It's just really important for everyone. And his main point with his areas in cities is that people who live in cities don't have the time and the money to go to the Adirondacks or the White Mountains or some other paradise place for vacation. They need paradise in their community. So I just want to highlight one other place that's really, really special that I think is truly landscape planning for mental health, and that's Gould Farm in Monterey, Massachusetts. Has anyone heard of Gould Farm? Um, so Gould Farm is amazing because it's basically a residential treatment program for people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So you go to Gould Farm, you live there, you work there on the farm, you have support from a social worker and a psychiatrist, and you try and recover just by being there. You belong there, you're in a community there. It's just a beautiful place. And on Gould Farm, they have their farmland. Uh, you might be working in the kitchen, you might be working doing maple syrup or in their woodlot. Um, but what they also have are these woods that are considered sacred. So when you are part of Gould Farm, you're considered part of the Gould Farm family forever. So you can go back and visit and still feel like you're part of the Gould Farm family. And having these woods there on Gould Farm 
for people to go to while they're there and for people to come back to is a critical part of the healing uh, benefits of that farm. And um, we're looking into officially putting one special old spot of their woods into essentially a forever wild program. So everyone will know in the future that that forest will be there. Um, so I want to just wrap up with a quote from Ukrainian uh, theoretical physicist uh, Anastasia Makarevia, uh, who put forth with her uh, co-author, Victor <coughs> Gorshaw, a uh, really important theory that forests regulate themselves and the water system of the entire planet. And they call this theory the biotic pump. And it's been mathematically underappreciated in terms of local and global cooling because this evapotranspiration in climate models is just considered a constant, like a black box. And what I've realized in all of our climate models that are geared towards carbon may be overlooking other powerful factors. And I think this is really something, you know, things are serious. We need to critically evaluate what we're doing, what are our assumptions, what are our variables, are we missing things? And what she has said is that, and their work has extensive publications, is that forests are so critical for bringing water across the land. And without connections of intact forests bringing water across the land, things are going to get really bad really quickly. Forget about carbon in the atmosphere. We're cutting off our life, lifelines. And she basically said that this is a tipping point where we have natural ecosystems that can work for the stability of the climate and disturbed ecosystems that can no longer do that work. And if you look at the historical uh, examples and examples around the globe today, there's really powerful evidence for this. So we need to be careful, particularly with forests that reach down and connect to large bodies of water. So I will just leave you with this thought, you know, how can we get to this kind of beautiful green and blue world that we're so fortunate to have now? And how do we keep that for the future? Um, you know, I think we need to ask, how did we get here? And how can we really make some clear decisions and decide what kind of a future do we want? Um, and I would suggest that we want a future with health, with truth, with love. And that can be translated into rural, suburban, and urban communities, and that we need to focus immediately on our essentials and uh, more than 1%. <coughs> Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. What was that theory again? The, Pardon? The Ukrainian... Oh, oh, the biotic pump. The biotic pump? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, hi. hi. I, I just wanted to make two comments. First, say this was a great presentation, mm -hmm. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so important to keep in mind to, uh, to develop areas that are accessible to people who have the kinds of disabilities that make it difficult to uh, transverse the, the average trail, that this should be a part of all of this kind of thinking. And second, I wanted to comment on my own experience and the experience of others of trying to encourage this perspective in our, some of our distressed, the designated distressed communities. I live in one where every parcel of land is looked at as um, an opportunity to build an entity that will pay taxes because none of us can afford to stay there anymore. It is a real challenge in those kinds of areas. Mm -hmm. And justifiably. Mm -hmm. So two points, that exactly your point about the accessibility is one reason why I put the East Coast Greenway on there mm -hmm. as kind of, you know, because it does go through some beautiful accessible areas. And some of you may know that um, Simsbury purchased a mm -hmm. large parcel with uh, prime farmland and a habitat corridor called Meadowwood. And we're hoping to put an accessible trail around the whole border of that, which would be so beautiful, you know, out in the field. Um, so I absolutely agree with you about that point. Um, in terms of people being able to stay in their communities because it's so expensive and looking at every piece of land is an opportunity, um, 
and that's, that's a problem I think we can all agree on. Um, and I do think it is a problem that every piece of land, if it's, this is why I put open space in quotes, like what are we gonna do with it? Yeah. But what you're talking about is a money problem. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be solving money problems by throwing our ecological lifelines under the bus. Mm -hmm. And just to give you an example, our incentives are somehow screwed up and I don't know how to fix them because I'm too busy talking about my two topics. I don't have room for any other topics. Mm -hmm. But it's just two examples in Simsbury that are just mind boggling. Um, the Hartford had a big campus in Simsbury and then they moved out. Mm -hmm. And so then they didn't want to pay taxes on their buildings anymore so they blew them up. And then guess what we did? Somebody built a huge thing on gorgeous prime hundreds of acres of farmland right next door. So now we have blown up buildings in a crumbling parking lot with infrastructure and everything next to what used to be prime farmland, which is now covered with hideous apartment buildings. And everyone's yelling at me, like, why didn't I do something about it? It's like, <laughs> I can't do everything. And we also have a, um, a motel on Route 10, right on Route 10, um, that I'm not sure if it got sold or being redeveloped. I don't know the details about it. But I heard about it and I said, oh, that's a great spot for affordable housing. Everyone's talking about affordable housing. Guess what it's being developed as? Luxury apartments. Mm -hmm. Like there should be some kind of way that we can balance our incentive structure because the affordable housing issue is a money issue more than a building issue. And so I think we really need to think about that and how we can rethink this equation because so many buildings are empty from the pandemic. Um, I think we need to think about where are appropriate places and not throw our ecological lifelines under the bus for another serious issue. It doesn't help anyone. Yes? Your comment makes me want to say something that I wasn't already prepared to say, but I want to first talk about um, like the role of properties like Remington Woods and, and Bridgeport, urban forest. Um, that could potentially serve as old growth forest resources, connection to nature, um, but instead, like we will be under pressure for more development, more building, whatever. Like those are the things that are, are pressing current day fights mm -hmm. um, of place and value. But what I was going to talk about before your last comment was, but I hear your presentation, isn't that like development and housing is a problem, but that we have opportunity for forests being strategically placed more broadly. Like, so even in the center of a very developed Simsbury, um, we have the old growth forest. Like those things aren't counter. You can have a thriving forest, an opportunity right there. Uh, and to start seeing opportunity that way. Um, I also hear your presentation, and I'm not sure if this is what you would hope for, but conservation for just open space is different from old growth forests and the need and the benefits from, from having old forests are another level that we should probably be considering and not just open space. Yeah, I could cry. <laughs> that was like an A plus. Um, yes. Um, so yes, and I just want to say I am a huge fan of the Remington Woods project that absolutely should become a 400 acre community wilds for that community. And the reason why I think it has a good chance, which it's always like some weird glitch is because it's actually kind of contaminated with munitions and all uh -huh. kinds of stuff. <laughs> so they might not be able to develop it. Uh -huh. And it actually might be forever wild yeah. just because they're like, well, we can't mess with that. <laughs> right. So that's almost like it yeah. saved cool. itself. Right. Yeah, uh -huh. that's some hope for it. Uh -huh. um, so that's I, I fervently hope that that will be the future for Remington Woods. And I absolutely agree <laughs> that we just need to make some strategic decisions because how are we helping everyone if we make the community less beautiful and less healthy. Um, it's not helping people that we invite into our community um, for any reason, to, be, to visit or to live there. Um, and then the last thing, yes, we need to make more specific decisions um, because we have no specific protection for our land except for that 1% that I talked about. 
Um, I'll, I think I saw your hand up earlier. So. <laughs> Um, so I, I um, live and work in New Haven in mental health services, so I appreciate kind of the convergence of ideas here and your emphasis on, on cities and what we can do in, in cities. And I also serve on the on board of Gather New Haven, which is a land trust and farming and access to the um, coastal environment as well. But my specific question, because I work in healthcare, is there's a lot of discussion about nature-based prescriptions. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Is that a road that we want to go down? Is that going to be helpful in this regard, or is it going to complicate things? I would say that, um, you know, Olmsted recommended nature-based prescriptions, actually. I'm going to talk about that in the next, ses next session. He actually prescribed that doctors would tell young mothers to go to Central Park as uh, kind of restorative, because he knew that they were tired and there were so many demands on their time. So. I am a fan of nature-based prescriptions, but I think when we talk about urban green space, it's not specific enough. Mm -hmm. And that's why I showed you that data on parks versus woodlands. So, you know, people are also attracted to water. And Olmsted was very thoughtful on trying to make his parks places that you would be able to get away from the sights and sounds of the city. That's how he developed them. He also developed paths that weren't straight ahead, but were mm -hmm. meandering because not knowing exactly what's coming is what helps the mind to relax and stay in the present. So I think we need to look at the data that's there on what's the most beneficial. It's not just green space. And I think there's an insufficient attention on those specifics, which are really important. Yes? It, to get a little more in the weeds and the research, is there any research that explores how we resonate like an immediate interaction with a kind of a disturbed natural area if that would if we'd have a more disturbed response to it than a natural area that's kind of more healthy well i think sense. i think it uh i don't know about any specific studies but i do know that that was one of um uh to to kind of harken back to olmstead he wanted to have natural environments where things did not look out of place because that damaged the ability to relax and be able to just kind of be in that environment. So that's why he only planted native plants and tried to have not distract people from the nature. So I think that a disturbed environment is often much hotter. You can see the signs of disruption, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's distracting from being able to just be in that natural place and enjoy the natural scenery of it. And I have had people say that they feel there's something different when they're in an old growth forest. They somehow feel safer than in another environment. Or um, elders, native elders, that they're, what they want to do when they are dying is go visit an old growth forest. It's like a very spiritual calling. Yes? Have you seen any examples of cities or towns or counties using land use zoning to encourage this type of development? Mm, you mean encourage old growth forests? Well, or encourage this strategic If you're plan. in a city and something has to be re, 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 redone, having some element, some percentage is open space. So there's a, in Connecticut, a number of towns have conservation zoning. So you get a break on the lot size. So let's say it was a two acre lot, you go down to a one acre lot might get an extra lot, but then 50% of the development is set aside as open space. Mm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not really my expertise. Mm. Actually, I'm not saying it's going to be a human humor. But yeah, many towns do that. They have um, open space subdivision regulations in their plan, they make the regulations. So like, like what you were saying, they'll have reduced uh, you know, front yard setbacks and stuff like that, so you need more lots of piece of property, but at the same time, you're getting more open space um, on, the, on the same piece of land. Mm -hmm. A lot of times have done that already. <clears throat> yeah, Simsbury does have a 20% set aside, but I think they're trying to eliminate that or allow some kind of payment in lieu of the set aside. And what I've noticed in Simsbury, because I looked at the maps a lot uh, related to the Safe Routes to School program, because we were trying to find these little secret ways for the kids to get to school, or those little 20% areas are often like a little wetland area that's now serving as a wildlife corridor, or you know these other kind of critical things 
or a little ledgy or whatever. So I, I'm, I agree that that would be, I think that's a way to get these little bits and help connect well, the Well, that's the way to get it done. I mean, the reality is you need some sort of regulatory system right. that you know, can't force towns or cities to do it. But I mean, how did Central Park get there? Someone had that vision. Yeah, or you know, uh, Bushnell, Bushnell Park mm -hmm. in Hartford, yeah, mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, that was um, done by public vote in Hartford. But can you imagine Hartford now without Bushnell Park? Um, but that was a fight even then. The business community was totally opposed to it. So, yes. Um, the the processes to achieve mental health but generally would you say universal uh, I would say pretty universal if you're starting from a baseline of pretty good mental health it depends on if you have a bad mental health situation there might be right. different processes to try and recover it so in listening to you and don't misunderstand me I love treats but I also know that there are cultures on this planet that live in an area where there are no treats Southwest, steps, <laughs> Asian steps, pampas. and But I kind of believe that they have, most people there don't have any worse mental health than we do, and yet they don't have access to trees. So what I'd like to get to is, how can I put this? So it has to do with, what I hear, I think I hear you saying, it has to do with our environment and natural environment not necessarily trees. I think trees have extra benefits, but if I wasn't here in New England and was working in another part of the world that doesn't have trees, knowing what I know as a scientist, I would be fighting for that local ecology, right. okay. just like I'm fighting right. for this that's, one that's here. Good. 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 Yeah, so that's like a classic uh, science question, like what's the thing, what's the mechanism, right? And I grew up in that mentality. And what I've realized as my research has shifted from being like super nuts and bolts, neuroscience, like this molecule, this receptor, um, to then working on metabolism and actually dietary therapy for neurological disorders, and also this ecology work, is sometimes there isn't just one thing. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And maybe some of the parts are more important. That's why I highlighted the terpenes and the beauty. Um, uh, but it's not just terpenes in the uh, aroma and the forest. There's a lot of things in that. And it's different in every forest. So there's so many variables. I would say we really don't know. Part of it also could be just the quiet. You know, it's so hard, the, the, just the, the, the mental relaxation. And that's why I think forests are particularly powerful because you can be in a really small forest and still feel that kind of feeling of getting away. Yes. Um, oh. Can I ask her first because you sure. want to ask a yeah. question? Is there a place in the world that's doing this well that we can emulate? I should have a good answer to that question, but um, I don't. I do know that Tasmania um, is the first country in the world to go carbon negative because they stopped cutting down a whole bunch of their forests. Um, so that's one thing. I do know that Bhutan is one that has like a, a priority on keeping their forests. They're like the happiest country in the world. Um, so that would be a couple of couple of ideas, but you know, we should start here. Do the best we can. It's, it's going pretty fast in the UK. Oh yeah, there's so a big rewilding the effort. Squat, you know, that, I mean, they're, they're on top of all sorts of things, including that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they have a long way to go though. Oh yeah, they <laughs> a lot of fields. They a lot of fields. I just thought uh, maybe we could learn from what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I do think the first thing to do is start with some basic principles and then, you know, apply them. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we've been to Muir Woods 
And even though I don't consider myself to be at all spiritual, it was really close when I got to Muir Woods because <coughs> it was with these massive trees and they were all so old and, and it had like a very humid atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was like a cathedral. It really was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Old forests, they become kind of wet and just like a really, um, mm -hmm. it's a powerful experience, I agree. Yeah, sorry All about that. back to um, open spaces, do, is that, I know Connecticut started the pollinator pathways. Do you, do you, pot, like, do you plant specific flowers for the pollinator pathway program, or you just leave the wild, like these spaces? For our natural areas, we're not planting things in there. We can remove plants if they're problematic, but we're not purposely <coughs> planting things. But we are encouraging people to plant natives in their yard, and that's the co-branding with the um, uh, homegrown, homegrown national park program. So we're trying to tell our town, like, if you're planting, we have a policy. If you're planting trees, they have to be native. And by the way, if you have tree of heaven, remove it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like now, right now. Really? Yeah. yeah, it's the host for the spotted lantern fly. Just oh. kill it. Don't ask questions. Oh. Just kill it. Oh. <laughs> Just kill them. Yes. Yeah. yeah, she yeah. agrees. Yeah. We both agree. We're killing them all. Yes. Yeah. So I live in the Maryland Trust. We have probably like 68. We have a big farm plus some acres throughout the town. They're forested. We don't have trails on them. I'm wondering how long we don't do anything with them. How long do they have to be untouched before they would be old growth forests? Is it like is it like several hundred years? Is it I don't know how long would it take to just reach that status? Yeah, so old growth forests, I like to do use a definition based on characteristics rather than age. Sure. But in New England forests start to develop old growth characteristics sometime after a hundred, hundred and twenty-five years. And you know, people kind of use one fifty as sort of a rough rule of thumb. How can we determine if what we have would, would fall into that category? I don't know when they were, they, they would have at this point. I don't yeah. know when they happened. What me. town are you in again? Meriden. Meriden. Um, well, you could um, have someone check the age of some of your trees. Okay. That's a possibility. Sure. You may have land records of when, you know, what had happened, like with Belden Woods. Yeah, yeah. It was owned by. Um, this these two women and it was kind of minimally used as a woodlot and their heirs were allowed to take five cords of wood out of there every year mm -hmm. until they died sure. and they've been dead for a long time so we kind of know yes. what was happening for some time up until sure. they weren't around right. so you might have some records like that Thank you. sure yes Uh, yeah, I know that discussion has come up before, um, and it hasn't gone anywhere. But I really think, unless we start making some strategic decisions, it's literally like a race to the bottom. So um, I saw one other question. If it's quick, otherwise I should probably like. Well, I want to thank you all again. For so much for being here everybody this is really great to see all your faces and I've seen so many of you in the halls and in other sessions today so I'm excited to have you here
Uh, my name is Sophie Earhart. I am a wild carbon specialist at Northeast Wilderness Trust, and I also have worked in stewardship there and also developing the wild Wildlands Partnership Program. And Caitlin Mother, who's presenting with me today, is the new Wildlands Partnership Coordinator, and Dr. Susan Messino. So we've kind of combined our presentations, and I'll let them introduce themselves when they're going to talk. But um, I'll also introduce, this is Burnt Mountain. So this uh, wilderness preserve in Vermont is owned by the Nature Conservancy, and the Northeast Wilderness Trust holds a forever wild easement on it. And that's an example of a belt and suspenders kind of conservation where one land trust owns the property and another one holds the easement or not necessarily it can be another environmental organization. Um, and so Caitlin's going to be talking about that a little bit later more. And when we're all done, we'll have a Q&A, but since there's a lot of people here to present, if we run out of time, if you have questions for Caitlin or I, we have a table out there and we're happy to chat or provide you with any materials. So Northeast Wilderness Trust is a regional land trust. Uh, we were founded in 2002 to fill a niche in the land conservation world, which is we focus exclusively on wildlands conservation. And uh, we currently steward and protect uh, 76,000 acres now, it just went up a little bit across uh, the Northeast, so it's New, New England, all the states except, I think, Rhode Island we have preserves in, and also Northeastern New York. And we like to say that every uh, property that we protect has the potential to become a future old growth forest. Um, and I like to say right at the beginning that although our niche is focused on wildlands conservation, we view that as a complementary strategy to conserving well-managed woodlands. And we need both of these approaches because obviously we all love our wood products and it would be hypocritical not to have woodlands. But we focus on wildlands conservation because um, we're aware that the, there is such a slim uh, part of the conserved landscape is actually conserved as wilderness or primarily for nature. So I really appreciate uh, you being here today. I'm going to just click through a couple of these, talk about all that. So when we talk about wild, um, and, and I use some of these terms interchangeably, wilderness, wildlands, forever wild, um, we're talking about places where humanity has taken a conscious decision to step back and to allow natural processes as opposed to human management, um, let that unfold on the landscape and determine what species will be there, what ecological communities will be there. And so we're talking about land that is left to its own will. And when we talk about freedom, we're talking about freedom for all of the plants and animals uh, that live there. Um, from a legal standpoint, you know, compared to, like in Connecticut, you have the deep open space easements, which is a, an amazing program that's, you know, helped a lot of land trust conserve land. What we're doing would add another level of protection to an easement that has already protected a property from conversion for development, but also restricts logging and motorized vehicles and those types of things on the property. So it's very similar to like the federal uh, definition of a wilderness area with the restrictions on the motorized, mechanized uh, vehicles, and also uh, there's no harvest on our properties. So the Adirondack, that word forever wild, comes from that Adirondack protection, um, and that's a similar definition. So again, wilderness to us is where nature and not humans direct the ebb and flow of life. And there's a humility that's required to step back and to think that we don't know what is necessarily best for every corner of the, of the earth. And that's at the core of what we do. And I would like to share this uh, video, if I can get the, um, figure out how to get this technology to play right. Um, I'm gonna start it on this one, and I think drag it, so that I can just maybe drag it on top. And go full screen. So this video was just made by the Northeast Wilderness Trust, and it's on Forever Wild, and it features our, um, e uh, Forest ecologist Shelby Perry, who was going to be presenting today and couldn't join us, uh, and some other people involved with our work. I don't know if the sound is going to be here. 
And then you allow the body's natural healing powers to take over. Take this forest for example. For thousands of years, the lives of the trees and the wildflowers, the deer and the cougars that chase them, they're all connected. And when those cougars were killed off, the web of life was weakened. Rewilding means identifying those weaknesses and then creating the conditions for healing. And then comes the crucial step, stepping back giving those natural processes freedom to unfold over time. That freedom is what created the beauty and diversity of life. And that freedom is what will restore it in the future. We're standing right now in the greatest historical example of large-scale rewilding on Earth, New York's Adirondack Park, the largest protected area in the lower 48. The Adirondacks are wilder and healthier than a century ago. Since 1895, public lands within the park have been protected as forever wild. Off limits to logging and development, producing clean air, clean water, wildlife habitat, recreation, and jobs. If you want proof of what investment in rewilding can do, well, it's right here. Land trusts have done an incredible job of protecting managed timberlands, agriculture, and recreation areas but we haven't done such a good job at protecting wild places. After more than a century of good conservation work, only a sliver of the region is protected as wilderness, or as nature for nature's sake. And that's where we come in. By protecting forever wild places today, we are creating the ancient forests of tomorrow. We are expressing our love for this incredible place on Earth. overlook the global treasures in our own backyard. Over the last hundred years, the temperate forests of eastern North America have actually been expanding, unlike every other temperate forest on the planet. It's an incredible story, and we need to build on that momentum. Think of all the carbon stored in this forest, including underground in the soil. Storing carbon as much and as fast as possible helps cool the planet. And forests can store more carbon when allowed to grow older and wilder. But rewilding isn't only a cost-effective way to help mitigate climate change. It's also profoundly hopeful. It won't solve every problem, but it's an essential tool, creating opportunities for nature and people to thrive. If we step up with love and wisdom, and then simply step back, nature gives us more wilderness. We know how to help nature do this. We just need to let nature do her healing work on an even grander scale. We know that wilderness works. 
providing clean air and water, stabilizing the climate and creating wildlife habitat and reinvigorating the human spirit. And beyond all these gifts, wild places and our wild relatives at home here simply have the right to be free. My son and I love to look for animal tracks and to see who's moving around the neighborhood, to remember that our family is just one of many. When you visit a Northeast Wilderness Trust Preserve, you are surrounded by families. Bobcats sunning themselves on a slope, bears parking their cubs up in trees while looking for food down below, or peregrine falcons building nests high above up on a cliff. All our neighbors just trying to get by, raise their young, and have some fun along the way, being free. Can you see it? That land of freedom, wholeness, and health? The eyes of the future are looking back at us, thankful that we chose to be good ancestors, that our devotion to each other and to all our relations inspired a grassroots rewilding movement. In Eastern North America and around the planet, people are working to conserve wild lands and waters place by place, knitting up green and blue ribbons of protected habitat, wrapping the globe in beauty, and fostering freedom and justice for all. We know how to do this, and the time has come to create that wild future. Will you join us and show your love for this world? The best place to start rewilding? Here. The best place to start rewilding is here. And the best place to start rewilding? Here. I've got to show you the takeouts because it's the funniest part. It's the last one. <laughs> Thank you for your patience there with the technology. Okay, so I love that video and I just thought it could say so much of what I wanted to say better than I could say it. So um, I'll just touch a little bit on the biodiversity um, piece that Shelby touched on. And biodiversity is supported in forever wild forests because trees grow old and die on their own time frames, And species form multiple generations, forest complexity increases, Niche habitats are naturally created. Coarse woody debris, as you can see, dominates the landscape. And natural disturbances create dynamic multi-age forests. And all of this, basically, biomass increases year after year. Uh, this is a beautiful, old, messy, mossy forest. Um, this is what a wild, resilient forest looks like in Maine, at least one forest. This is. Um, our Howland Research Forest, and um, it's got some very old trees on it. They've been studying carbon sequestration there for a long time. Um, but it, this photo really captures a lot of why wild forests are so important for biodiversity. So if you check out all of the tip-ups, the moss-covered rocks, uh, the lichen, the fallen trees, the cavities that they create, it's a mosaic of old trees and young trees, and there are so many micro habitats in this messy forest, which meet the requirements of an incredible diversity of plant, animal, moss, lichen, fungal lives. And this complexity not only harbors biodiversity, it's also beautiful, it creates resilience, and it stores an immense amount of carbon. 
So one thing you might have noticed that I haven't um, described as wildlands or wilderness is pristine or remote or untouched um, by humans. So most of us know the history of land use in the Northeast since Europeans settled here across northern new, uh, new off across the northern forest we've cleared 85 uh, like three quarters 75 percent of the forested landscape was cleared by the 1800s for lumber and for agriculture and those forests have started to regrow actually i want to go back uh, one slide so um, the good news is that in connecticut or anywhere rewilding doesn't rest on finding places that have been spared the ax. Um, I love this definition, which was written by one of our previous uh, executive directors, but wilderness is not simply a special kind of place, but rather a special commitment we make to a place. That commitment is freedom to animals and to the natural processes that produce integrity, beauty, and diversity of the land community. And so what we're talking about is giving nature the chance to rebound. So today, um, many of these forests have regrown, thanks in large part to a lot of your work, to the state of Connecticut's work with their open space easements and the state parks and state forests. And so a lot of these trees are getting to be 75, 100 years old in some places that haven't been logged. So they feel old to us, but really on tree time, they are teenagers, they're middle-aged. Um, and this is a prime time to protect some of our forests as forever wild. Um, because as they become more mature, obviously they're more um, attractive for harvest. There's more board feet there, obviously. Um, and so the fact that something wasn't logged 50 years ago doesn't mean it's not gonna be logged in the next 10 years. Um, and we know also they are incredibly, incredible carbon sinks and they're critical for wildlife. So again, I'm going to emphasize that we see this work as a complementary strategy to conserving well-managed woodlands um, and sustainable farming areas, because obviously we're gonna to continue to use um, the land for the products we need, but we also need to do a little bit more for nature. And this is another definition I love for rewilding, which is, in essence, it's giving the land back to wildlife and wildlife back to the land. So speaking of rebounding, I'm gonna quick go through these just because I love these pictures. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, many of our wild cousins across the Northeast were either eliminated from their ranges or on the brink. So species like moose and black bear, you know, fisher, lynx, even now common species like the white-tailed deer and turkey were rare not so long ago. And as our forests have regrown, wildlife has started to return. Uh, some species, like the eastern mountain lion, or like we say in Vermont, the catamount, um, have yet to come back, although some people say they've seen some. But, <laughs> but they are bound to return with deliberate action to conserve our wild forests and to rewild as much of the landscape as we can. So there's that guy. So let's look at, this is a map, this is of the Northeast, and I'll do a Connecticut one next, but this is all of the conserved land. This data is from um, the Nature Conservancy. It's actually been updated recently. This map is just getting updated, and I think Susan's gonna share that from the wild, no, you're not, okay. So, um, yeah, Harvard Forest, Highstead through the wildlands and woodlands, farmlands, communities, um, they've, they've updated some of this data set um, that we're gonna see next. But this is all the conserved land in New England, and it's a lot, like it's 25% of the landscape is conserved in some way. Um, but like I said, most of these forests are teenagers and they will remain that way through active management. Uh, only a small fraction are forever wild. That's how much is actually has permanent legal protection. It's about three to 4% of the landscape in New England. And you can see, obviously, the Adirondack Park Baxter State Park, the White Mountains, that's most of it, right? So there's a little bit of um, forever wild conservation in the region. So it's safe to say that the amount of permanently protected wild forests across the Northeast is woefully inadequate, and we need to start conserving more. And there are many strategies you know, are needed to fulfill 
our vision of a hopeful future. And conserving unmanaged wild forests is a useful, scalable, cost-effective strategy to, and complementary to the continued conservation of well-managed woodlands. So there are a lot of different targets floating around. You know, there's nature needs half and 30 by 30. What we're aiming for actually is 10% of the forest, the Northeastern forest to be conserved as wildlands. So we've got a ways to go um, from three to 4%, but there is a lot happening. Uh, this is a similar map for Connecticut. And this is pretty amazing. So that's all the conserved land in Connecticut. And so TNC does their gap status can be, you know, this includes all of it. So very strict protection and then, you know, all different levels. And that's forever wild conservation in Connecticut. That's the Adirondack Trail going up the side there. <laughs> so clearly we need both woodlands and wildlands, uh, but they're not the same thing. Yes. And wildlands are vastly underrepresented on the landscape. And Caitlin is going to share how Northeast Wilderness Trust is offering to invest in local land trusts initiatives and to add forever wild protection to preserves you already own or help fund uh, land acquisition. And uh, that's all I have to share with you right now. Can I ask if these maps are available on your website? Um, yes, the first two are, these aren't, but I could send them to you or you could take the big one and zoom in basically. You can also go to the Nature Conservancy I just want to point something out on this map before I get started on my part of the presentation. So this is all the uh, lands protected under a forever wild easement. And what this doesn't tell you is that a lot of these lands are high elevation lands and that aren't really subject to logging anyways. Um, so if you actually were to take a, another map and show and take out all the high elevation lands, there would, it really wouldn't look like very many wildlands um, that are permanently protected on our on our landscape. So I, I, I find that image striking. I wish I had it <laughs> to show you all, but um, that's another layer to the story. All right. Uh, my name is Caitlin Mother. I coordinate the Wildlands Partnership Program at Northeast Wilderness Trust, or our very fun acronym, NEWT. <laughs> um, and in 2017, Harvard Forest and the High Said Foundation released a comprehensive report on wildlands that recommended at least 10% of New England's forests are protected as wild. And as Sophie mentioned, only about 3 to 4% are protected today. So 10% is 3 million acres, and that's to be protected by 2060. So in 2020, um, Northeast Wilderness Trust launched the Wildlands Partnership Program with the intention to accelerate the pace of wilderness conservation across the Northeast, um, or wildland conservation. And as you noticed in the images that were just shared, wildlands are vastly underrepresented on our landscape. So um, the wildlands, what the Wildlands Partnership does is it provides funding um, to land trusts who commit to protecting their lands under a forever wild easement. So it's a commitment to nature. And um, since our launch of the program in 2020, we have worked with five organizations across three states, protecting nearly 9,000 acres under a forever wild conservation easement. So I'll share with you some of the projects uh, for our first phase of Wildlands Partnership. This is the Grand Lake um, Reserve in St. Lawrence County, New York and uh, that's owned by the Indian River Lakes Conservancy. So what's cool about this property is it's within the Adirondack to Algonquin Corridor, or the A2A, which um, came about from a very ambitious moose that walked from the Adirondack Park all the way to the Algonquin Provincial Park in Canada, um, spanning, that's, uh, the moose is named Alice, <laughs> and Alice walked 350 miles. <laughs> so it inspired a whole, um, initiative in the area, the A2A initiative, and there are a lot of land trusts are protecting land in this particular area. So we worked with Indian River Lakes Conservancy, and we also worked with the Thousand Island Land Trust, and together over 3,000 acres of land was protected under Forever Wild easement. Right. And this, um, I really love this image, it's beautiful. 
This is the Whales Back properties. Um, we co-hold an easement with Frenchman Bay Conservancy in Aurora, Maine. Um, so they applied for the program and we protected with Frenchman Bay Conservancy over 3,000 acres of wildlands in Maine. And then here in Connecticut, we worked on quite a few um, part, uh, projects with under Wildlands Partnership. So we worked with Cornwall, um, the Cornwall Conservation Trust. This is a lovely image with this um, beautiful old tree there. And so what was cool about the Cornwall Wildlands is um, they owned the Nancy Naltz Preserve and the Gray Ledge Preserve. And they applied to the partnership because they were seeking funding to add this addition here, the Red Mountain Preserve, which added 65 acres to their existing lands. And you can see it added more connectivity to the Mohawk State Forest there. So through the Wildlands Partnership, um, the, uh, Cornwall was able to get some funds to purchase this property. And all three of these lands are now protected under a forever wild easement held by Northeast Wilderness Trust. And then um, also in Northwestern Connecticut, we worked with the Salisbury Association that conserved over 680 acres across six preserves um, that are within a core forest area. So this particular um, block is the Hudson to Greens. Um, and a core forest was protected at high and low terrain that supports habitat, refuge, and safe passage for an array of species. And three of these uh, properties are along the Appalachian Trail. So, oh, and some images of the properties. And a quote from uh, one of their trustees. I'll just leave that on the screen for a second for everybody to take in. So, through the Wildlands Partnership, these are. Oh, I, it's kind of scrunched, I see. <laughs> Through the Wildlands Partnership, we are able to work um, across this whole landscape in Maine, New York, and Connecticut. So these were all of our phase one projects. Um, and you know what we learned from Wildlands Partnership is that, hey, this works. 9,000 acres were protected under forever, forever wild easements. Together, in partnership, we can commit to nature. Together, we can respond to biodiversity loss and climate change. This is an actionable item that we can all take. We are all skilled, skilled professionals, and through this partnership, we can protect more lands as wild. So I'm excited to announce today that we are going to begin accepting applications for our second phase of Wildlands Partnership beginning April 3rd. And with the Wildlands Partnership, you can, um, your land trust can apply and be awarded up to $250,000 to support new acquisitions and up to $125,000 to, um, for your existing lands that you own in fee. And your commitment is to protect lands under a forever wild easement um, for participating in the program. So uh, our emails will be on the last slide. I coordinate the Wildlands Partnership program. Please reach out to me. Oh, and I forgot to add one more piece. So in addition to um, the funds that you can receive, we have an optional um, carbon program that you can participate in to uh, receive an additional revenue stream. Excuse me, will we have access to these slides afterwards, or do we need to write things down? Um, I can send, um, I have an email sign up there, so you guys can write in your email, and I'm happy to send these to you, or we can figure out something. And also, we have an ad in the, um, the brochure from the event, which has our QR code to the Wildlands Partnership page. And Sophie's going to speak to stewarding wildlands. Okay, really quickly. <laughs> really quickly. So this will just be like five minutes. Okay. So I just want to, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, since I started at the Wilderness Trust, I, I wanted to be a land steward, but they didn't have that job available. So I've been doing that sort of assistant with that while I developed the Wildlands Partnership Program and the Wild Carbon Program. And now we've hired Caitlin and we have a new um, person taking on the carbon specialist job and I'm gonna be the Vermont land steward. So I'm very excited. So I've done a little bit of this, but I think the question is like, what would, for your stewardship team, what would be involved in stewarding wildlands? And the good news is it's probably the simplest stewardship out there in many ways, because the whole point is to step back. 
So um, a lot of times when you get um, funding, there's a lot of conditions or requirements. And um, this is easy because if you own the property in fee and Northeast Wilderness Trust or another organization, we're not the only people who hold forever wild easements. Um, if they hold an easement on it, you're required to do very little. So you're not um, practicing silviculture to favor certain species. You're not um, maintaining a habitat for one particular species through mowing or dredging or girdling trees. You're really trying to protect the entire forest and all the trees in it, the whole ecosystem, and then letting nature you know, do what it does. So um, you, you're not required to build trails, although you can build trails and you can maintain the ones that you have. Uh, you're not required, but you're allowed to attempt to control invasive species. Um, so that's you know what makes makes it a little easy. The challenge is, um, you know, it's recommended that you post your boundaries so that people know when they're entering <laughs> uh, uh, your conservation area because you might have right outside of it. You know, a lot of times we try to conserve areas with good adjacency to other conserved lands, woodlands, and um, recreation areas. So people need to know where they're supposed to park their ATVs when they come on your property, <laughs> right, or their bicycles. Um, and so that is one part. And then you're monitoring the properties by visiting them, what the stewardship team you know, regularly does, I assume, um, just to check and see if is there any timber trespass, ATV trespass, or there trails you need to you know, work with there. Um, that, that might, some of those concerns might be more so in the northeastern states where you have really large timberlands and you know, 6,000 acre preserves. Um, and more of a culture of a, you know, off-road vehicle uh, recreation area. Um, but that's something you, you know, you might need to gate a road entrance or something like that. Um, yeah. What about dogs? We have had a lot of problems with dogs that are running off the leash. Right. Ground right. birds, wildlife that yep. gets yep. hunted and killed. Right. Actually. Right. So. Um, with our preserves, and I think this varies by the land trust, so our e like the easement that we have on Northeast Wilderness Trust properties might be a little bit different than the one that your land trust would have, but you can require leashing, um, you can prohibit dogs, but yeah, other than that, I don't know, you know what you can do other than just require the well, leashes. Mm -hmm. um, because they will, you know, and a lot of people will say, you know, so part of it might just be education also, because a lot of people will say that well, my dog chases, but they'll never catch anything. They won't kill it. So people need to understand that the energy, you know, a rough grouse uses or a you know spruce grouse uses to escape a dog, is energy that then they have to like get more food for and do all of these things. So um, you know, it's probably an educational piece there too. Um, and so, uh, oh, that's actually uh, so. You can see the snowshoes. Boundary posting is great in the winter because you can see all the blazes. And <laughs> um, so the main challenge is really that Forever Wild injects an ethic that introduces some, some gray areas and some new challenges. Um, we at our Eagle Mountain Preserve uh, in New York, we just you know, spent a good amount of time planning out a trail um, for people to walk on and avoiding the sensitive areas and um, going past, you know, and um, year one, a beaver flooded the trail. And so we're all about beavers, right? Like we want beavers engineering on the landscape and creating those you know, early succession habitats, right? Because this is how the forest does that. Um, and so we're trying to, but we also want human access. Um, but with wilderness areas, we don't usually build structure, permanent structures. So we're, we're trying to decide, are we gonna put a boardwalk over the trail? Or are we, which in the, in the easements we hold on other land trusts, they're allowed to maintain their trails. So these things may be easier issues for you, I don't know. <laughs> but um, you know, those are the kind of things we grapple with a little bit, um, some of those gray areas. So if your land trust got into um, holding forever wild easements on private landowners, um, that, if you went that route, the thing that makes that a little bit easier is there's so few reserved rights that there's not a lot to monitor. So like generally when your stewardship team is checking up on an easement, they're probably checking on like 
the permitted activities and the extent of them and whether they're staying within the extent of the activities. But since this is really people stepping back and not doing any of those things, it's, uh, it's a little bit easier on your stewardship team. So um, that's all I have to say about stewardship for now, except that it's really fun. <laughs> I hope you get to do that for your life. Do you want to just, yeah, I'm just going to plug my computer. Can you move that up for a second? Do you have, uh, yeah, I can leave that. Let me look. Do you have an HDMI or do you want this little adapter thing? I have an HDMI. Okay. Let me know if it's in right. I have some cards I can put on the table here, which will get you in touch with me, but also anybody at the organization. Thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm really sorry. It's okay. So Connecticut's kind of a small state, and our chunks of land tend to be smaller. Are you guys interested in like a 50 or 100 acre parcel if, say, there's some woodlands around it? Yeah, it's, I mean, definitely, um, the nature of our work definitely is more for larger parcels, and I'm not in the state of how we think of the term wilderness. So we recognize that Connecticut's conservation story is very different than Maine. And we know that the parcel sizes are different. So um, we're going to look at all of our whoever applies on a case-by-case -case situation. So um, we just encourage anyone to apply. Even though like our goal is higher acreage, um, we, we understand the circumstances. So for a land trust that already owns property, mm -hmm. what would be the motivation to get those wild well, it's a, well, we do get money. <laughs> what would you even need? Um, well, I think it's a commitment to letting the land be. Um, it's it's, it's like also, a conservation yeah, easement. Yeah, it, it would be so a there, There'd be a, a conservation easement. <coughs> so, so, so how is that different from a land that's owning land that's the purpose of us owning it? Is right, it's exactly. So, so this is a, this is really... Um, please, oh, okay. please take so, your time. Um, basically, there's land trusts own land, and and it's common to feel like that's a sufficient protection on the land. Um, but the thing that happens with a conservation easement is that protection runs with the land. So land trusts, even if they last 25 years, 50 years, sometimes they dissolve. They run into financial hard times. Maybe they stay, maybe they decide to divest themselves of a property. The Nature Conservancy does this all the time, right? Like you can buy properties and sell properties and or transfer them to another organization. Or even if you keep the organization, keep uh, the property, your future board may have different priorities. And then what's done with that land is determined by whoever's managing it then. So similar to like, if you designate a wilderness area on federal lands, it's a wilderness area. But if it's just in the national forest, you know, federal lands or the BLM lands, it just depends on what the management plan is that's redone every 10 years or something. So how the land is managed can change. So your land trust right now might be like, we're forever wild, but that doesn't mean it necessarily has to stay that way. Conservation easements run with the land, just like an electric company easement or like anything. No matter what happens to your land trust, that that area is protected. But you said you can build trails. Mm -hmm. Can you build a parking area? Usually, what a lot of times when people do easements, they're like carve out a certain area, like how, you know where they want to put parking lot if they don't have one now or things like that. You know. It's certainly less recreationally focused. Um, but we do understand that connecting people to the place is very important. So. Good. Thank you. I look forward to more questions. So I'll um, get going on adding my piece to Why Wild.
Um, the main uh, reason why I'm part of this is I'm the Hartford County Coordinator for the Old Growth Forest Network. Um, and also now I'm on the board of Aton Forest, which does have Forever Wild properties in their portfolio. So really um, excited to be working with them in Northwestern Connecticut, where Sophie already showed us so many beautiful properties, you, and uh, Caitlin too, that you guys have been working on. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit more about how wild, because as you guys mentioned, Northeast Wilderness Trust isn't the only option. Um, Connecticut Land Conservation Coalition Council, CLCC, has a model forever wild easement on their resource page. Um, and another option for sort of intent to be forever wild is to put a forest in the old growth forest network. So in either of these situations, you're not getting money but you are you know, protecting that land with the intent to leave it in a natural condition. Um, the two messages I give in every talk is we need nature uh, more than ever and we need healthy brains. So I'm gonna add a little piece about that to this conversation. And um, I did actually um, pull up some maps um, which I said I wasn't going to, but now I went back and I pulled some maps from this latest um, database, Where's Wild, I'll call this Where's Wild. And I want you to keep in mind that the properties on this map are properties that currently have a wildlands intent, but they may not be permanently protected. So the management plan can change, um, which sort of addresses your question. And in fact, already since the map was made, some properties have been logged and have to be pulled off the map. So with that caveat, um, I will show you an overview of Connecticut. Um, so these are the areas which have a current management intent or legal restriction that they are intended to be, that they will be wildlands. And I want to um, say that the, due to the kind of pixelation, this blue is actually much larger than it is in real life. It just sh looks really big. So what I did is I showed you the whole um, <coughs> map of Connecticut. And I want to point out Fairfield County. It's actually cut off down here. But if I was in Fairfield County, well, that's a pretty wealthy county with some beautiful land. I'd be pretty mad. Like, where's my nature preserve? Where can I go? Um, you know, and you can absolutely see the Appalachian Trail up here. So then what I did is I took another snapshot of Middletown. And uh, since here we are, so this is sort of centered on Middletown. There's a couple of properties close by here. But as you can see, not that much. And then the other area I chose to focus on is Stratford, because at the last session I was in, there was a question about Remington Woods, a 400-acre property for which there's a sort of discussion. What are we going to use it for? Could it be a nature preserve for the community? And I think you can see from this map that this community needs a nature preserve. <laughs> so now everyone's going to get on the board, get on board with um, protecting Remington Woods, hopefully as a forever wild property. Um, so I want to just make, I love the rewilding video that was shown today. I just saw it a couple of days ago for the first time. And I love how it talks about love and, and, and talks about just, you know, so many wonderful values. So I'm going to go quickly through my slides and not repeat any of those. Um, but, you know, we need the values of humility and humanity to really figure out how to have a healthy global health and human ecology, which is the name of a certificate program that I started a couple of years ago at Trinity College to sort of put together different courses that emphasize these values. It's very interdisciplinary, and we need to think about this from so many different perspectives. Um, but first, I thought, um, I liked how Aaron Mayer said, you know, we need to rewild here in our brains. So I thought I'd take you to your brain, to the most simple drawing I could find of an individual neuron in a brain. And this is a pyramidal neuron because it has this triangular shape. And you can see it's in your cortex, which is kind of our most considered advanced uh, processing area. And so you can see it has all these processes. And if we zoom in on it, you can see here, um, this is a close up of some dendrites. You can see all these little bits here. These are the dendritic spines. So each one of these little pieces is talking to another neuron. Another process from another neuron comes in and talks here. So you can imagine all the stuff that's going on here attaching to all these dendritic spines. And then associated with each of these connections between this and another neuron 
is glial cells, blood vessels. Oh, there's, this is like a zoo of stuff. And it's only because of this special staining technique that we can see this one individual neuron in all its kind of magical uh, structure. So um, the other thing that we have is that one process coming out doesn't have any of those. That's the axon. So each neuron is taking in all of this information and then sending it out via this one process. Now, um, the amazing thing about one neuron is we don't know how it works. So the idea that we know how the entire brain works is not um, logical. So, um, but we, you know, we keep on studying things, keep on trying to figure it out. That's what our brains do, right? But at the same time, we try and accumulate information and do experiments and learn things. We always have to remember that there's so much we don't know. So I want to just zoom up on one of these little interfaces right here. And this is a super simplified schematic. Like, this is what's going on in a super simplified schematic. All these incredibly complex molecules. You know, each one of these orange dots contains about 5,000 molecules of transmitter, all this transport and synthesis, so many things going on at the same time. And what I really started to appreciate as I started looking more at ecology is a forest ecosystem is more complex than the human brain. It's unbelievably complex below the ground with so many species above the ground, in the canopy, the interaction with the atmosphere. It's magical and inspiring and really uh, it's not something that we understand, which is why we need humility. Um, but if you look at a brain, it looks like one big glob of stuff. And so that's, I think, the, the dichotomy is there's so much complexity going on there. But sometimes it just looks like a big glob of stuff. And if you look at it and you touch it, it feels just like soft tofu. And um, <laughs> Right? So you're like, well, what, what, what does it matter if you take this piece out or this piece out? Well, this piece here could be responsible for language. You know, this piece here could be responsible for recognizing faces. So it's highly specialized, even though it looks like one big glob. And this is the issue with the micro niches and micro habitats and special species that are in our ecosystems. So um, in honor of this being kind of the wrap up of the bicentennial year, of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's birthday, I wanted to just talk about his vision and appreciation for the mystery and everything that we don't know. And um, he was unusual at a time when people wanted to like kind of know exactly what's going on. I know as a scientist, people are always asking, what's the mechanism? You know, we want to quantify things, we want to measure things, we want to assign money value to things. And there are some things that are just mysteries, and we need to. Um, revel in that, not be upset about it. Um, and I love the quote that he uh, had, um, which eventually was translated into the Organic Act of 1916, um, the purpose of national parks, to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife for the enjoyment of future generations. And while we're often thinking of five-year cycles or 10-year cycles or at most 20 year cycles, Olmsted scholars said he was really looking at least 40, 100, or even 200 years in advance. So um, his greatest joy was at the end of his life to see some of his properties like uh, Prospect Park in Brooklyn you know, starting to come to their full fruition. He knew it would take a long time. And he was thinking about that super long timeline in the future like the Native American seven generations in the future. How often do we do that? And how different would our lives be if we had been thinking about that and keeping track of our ecological lifelines? So a little bit more about Olmsted. He really was centered on health. Um, he was a general secretary in the Civil War and um, you know, saw the trauma in, in what soldiers endured. He knew that nature offered preventative medicine Rewilding is like preventative medicine for natural systems and for us. And at a time when health, um, particularly in urban areas, was uh, focused on sanitation and toxins, he was focused on sunlight, foliage, clean water to recharge our battery. Because he could see it was being discharged and being we were being worn down by urbanization. 
and he knew that nature engages yet relaxes the mind and focused on the power of beauty and knew that everyone deserves access to this from small city areas to national parks. He wanted them to be democratic spaces where people could have meandering organic interactions. And he saw nature as a really profound antidote to the stress of urbanization. And his childhood experiences in nature, particularly in Hartford, in Keeney Park, the 10 Mile Woods, um, were pivotal in his career. He wrote letters about the North Branch of the Park River saying that this should be conserved. He basically laid out a design of Hartford saying that this investment in these parks would pay off you know, in the, in the future of this rapidly growing city. So he really had a very clear vision about that. Um, Central Park, in general, was designed to serve New York as a public health, health facility. No appointments, no people in white coats, you know, no cost. You just go there. Um, and he told physicians to tell their, to um, prescribe nature to their patients, which is something that's coming back now. It's kind of back to the future with trying to prescribe nature. And um, he particularly told physicians to tell their young mothers to bring their babies to the park to recharge their batteries. And he also was really aware of the most vulnerable among us, that a majority of all inhabitants of the city are women and children, sickly and aged or weakly, nervous and delicate persons, and that the park is adapted to benefit none so much as those who have barely the courage, strength, and nerve required to visit it. So linking nature or in forests and health, brain health, is a really rapidly advancing research topic um, in the UK. Um, there's a forest, and its motto, the NH NHS forest, growing forests for health. I really like this photo. It just emphasizes that this is for everyone, all ages, all abilities, um, all levels of health, sickly or health. It, it benefits everyone. And we have to think of health and rewilding our ecological lifelines really as money in the bank. We can't put a price on it, but it's like money in the bank because, in fact, money can't restore it. Money can't fix health if it's unrecoverable. Money can't fix a destroyed ecosystem. We can do the best we can, but we have no idea if we can recover it. Um, so just a little bit about some special populations. Um, there's been research that um, wild nature lowers PTSD in veterans. It really helps with at-risk teens. There's been a lot of research on the healing power of awe in promoting empathy and compassion and altruism and uh, diminishing our ego and um, promoting all the things that you would want to to be characteristics and qualities of people that you live with in your community. And, and almost like a throwback to Olmsted, when Walter Reed Medical Hospital moved to Bethesda, they built a specific healing nature area called the Green Road, Green Road Project, um, so that injured service members and their families could spend time there together. And they started some research on this where they looked at biomarkers of stress, natural language analysis, changes in gene expression, so sort of short-term things that would, that would um, be obvious, um, how injured service members were feeling with their language analysis, and changes in gene expression, which is how you functionally change your cells and your neurons. So how can you recover from whatever disruption and uh, disorder you're suffering from? And I like this quote from Dr. Frederick Foote, a neurologist and retired from the Navy. Um, you just provide the nature and the mind takes care of the rest. Um, Olmsted felt that the highly democratic and egalitarian nature of these parks could begin to unbend some of these debilitating effects of anxiety, class shame, and racism. And these, this benefits everyone, the people who have uh, cause that and the people that are suffering from it, right? It helps to, to basically equalize everyone. Um, and I really like this quote. I don't know the author, 
But the way you alchemize a soulless world into a sacred world is by treating everyone as if they are sacred until the sacred in them remembers. So he felt like a well-designed park could become a feedback loop where the environment would uplift the individual who would in turn uplift others by example. And he called this the silent and unconscious influence. We need these positive feedback loops. This is how we pull out from tipping points. We need to restructure and enter into a, a positive iterative, iterative cycle. And I um, found this quote just today. Landscape moves us in a manner more nearly analogous to the action of music than anything else. Mm -hmm. The attention is aroused and the mind occupied without purpose gives the effect of refreshing rest and reinvigoration of the whole system. And um, we need things like this. So just a tiny snippet about the Old Growth Forest Network founded by Dr. Joan Maloof, um, ecologist, and she just stepped down as executive director. And she really had a vision of a network of sacred places, one in each county for everyone. And she really thought very purposefully about kids being able to have a special place that they could count on to go visit. Um, and right now, the network has 189 forests in 32 states. There are currently four forests in Connecticut, two pending, and I think some others on the, on the road. Um, Rod Parley is a county coordinator for Tallinn County, and I don't think there are any other county coordinators here. Gary Gregory's here really downstairs. Way, We're, yeah, <laughs> Connecticut's trying to sneak in at number 200. I just, well, you know, sit on your prayer pad for that. We're hoping for a big celebration. Um, and this, you know, the mission to, to protect these old and old growth forests really aligns with Biden's executive order in April 22 to do that exactly on federal land. Um, there's some great resources on the Old Growth Forest Network site as well as on the Northeast Wilderness Trust site about wild carbon and forests and health and biodiversity and really, really great resources that I would highly recommend. Um, one of them is on Shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing, taking in the forest through our senses, and the quantified research that it can lower blood pressure, improve immune function, and lower stress hormones. All of those things may not sound like brain things, but they all interact with this little bundle, which is how your neurons communicate with each other. And the things I just mentioned have both short-term and long-term effects on brain function. Um, Joan has done research and pulled together some research that's in this vitamin F paper about how older and more pristine forests have the greatest perceived benefits and are perceived as more beautiful. Um, and beauty is the most important quality preferred by visitors. Um, a study by Wood et al. looked at ecological richness and restorative benefit and also found a positive correlation. Um, I just want to mention the kids again and this take home message that exposure to nature as a child results in increased mindfulness as an adult. There's not many things that you can do um, that can prevent mental illness in such a powerful way as provide this kind of lifelong resilience. Um, I also wanted to mention, which I mentioned in my last talk, that all green space is not created equal. So in the UK, when they did studies about different natural environments and benefits, they found that when they distinguished green space into woodland and grassland, higher daily exposure to woodland was associated with higher scores for cognitive development and a lower risk of emotional and behavioral problems. And this was in over 3,500 teens and preteens. So this is important to get ahead of mental health problems in all of us and especially in our young people. It's really important. So just like Sophie and Caitlin, I want to just emphasize that, you know, of course, we need all of these things. We need nature. We need research. We need resources. And in order to make these decisions, we need to make com common sense, compassionate, and science-based decisions. And doing that will align with public opinion and fiscal responsibility. And I'm very confident of that. Um, I want to mention another uh, topic that I've been looking into lately. Um, that we don't talk about a lot with forests, and that's their ability to regulate the water cycle. 
And I'm very inter inter interested in this work by Dr. Anastasia Narkivia on the biotic pump, which is talking about how forests regulate the water cycle, bring water across land, and cool temperatures locally and globally, and how our large forests and our forests that connect to large bodies of water are critical. And this may be an underappreciated factor in our global warming um, models. And if it is, we should figure that out as quickly as possible so that we don't make a wrong turn. And this is something we talked about a lot in the Science and Technology Working Group, how important it is to not make wrong turns. So there's all this, uh, you know, what do we need? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We have to make sure we're not doing the wrong thing, step one. Um, I also want to say that as a scientist, I don't like the idea that that people will always defer to experts. Everyone can ask good questions. And s every citizen should be asking good questions and demanding that we use evidence-based uh, strategies to deal with our problems that we have right now. I'm very concerned about some of the math that's being used, and I don't really know who's in charge of checking the numbers. Um, so I guess I just want to wrap this up and make sure we have some questions. You know, where. Really, one of the questions we have is where the wild things are. We know we need more wild lands. Um, I think that we should address this conceptually, not with a percentage basis. We should pick out what are the key pieces of our landscape. Old or old growth forests, riparian corridors, uh, critical habitats like uh, Atlantic cedar swamps and floodplain forests and all these trap rock ridges, all these special things we have in Connecticut. We should focus on those pieces immediately. Otherwise, we could have an accident and they could be run over. Um, and so trying to identify where these wild lands, why, where these wild woods are, will help us to knit together this strategic network of nature that we and all species need in order to keep things running, to allow species to migrate and thrive and adapt. And the last thing I want to mention is about a paper that I published um, coining the term proforestation. So I published this during my uh, research fellowship at Harvard with a climate scientist and an ecologist. And we realized looking at the literature that there was no specific term for a practice of preserving wildlands. And so we looked at the quantified data and we developed this definition of proforestation, the practice of protecting existing natural forests to foster continuous growth carbon accumulation, and structural complexity. So just everything that Sophie and Caitlin mentioned today. And I'm mentioning this explicitly, and I want to thank Rod brought buttons today, which I didn't know. So if you'd like a button, um, we have some. Um, but I want to mention this because I've heard some misrepresentations about it, that it bans management. It doesn't ban needed management. It's like an evidence-based approach. It doesn't ban people, because national parks are an are an example of proforestation, and they certainly welcome people. So does the, the properties we have in Simsbury that are under natural area stewardship, which is an example of proforestation. Um, we know that there are quantifiable benefits in national parks, wilderness areas, et cetera, in terms of carbon, biodiversity, fewer invasive species, et cetera. Um, we know that we need strong evidence-based policies to protect our, whoops, to protect our lifelines. Uh oh, screwed something up here. Did your laptop? Oh, sorry. Got it. Um, and um, we know that we need a strategic plan to reduce waste and prioritize community health. Um, we really need to figure out how to use our resources for their highest and best use as local as possible. And making this strategic plan provides a match among science, common sense, and public values. And uh, so again, I'll say, where are the wild things? I don't know, but let's, let's figure that out together. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and, yeah, on. yeah, and Sophie, and you guys should come up here. You'll probably, people will probably have more questions for you guys because of the oh, partnership, so. All right. <laughs> Can we have access to your slides uh, Sure. Yeah, yeah, let's talk afterwards. We'll figure it out. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I saw your hand first. Yeah, so I'm so excited about this, all of this, the, the Forever Wild and then uh, all the 
this good messaging here. And then um, Dean works on the Litchfield Land Trust mm. thinking about this messaging. And I was wondering about, because uh, I think a lot of it has to do with education, of course, mm -hmm. and getting that message out. And I was wondering um, if I could cop your cool stuff and sayings <laughs> and, and share it out in our newsletters yeah. or things like that. Sure. Kind of, we have a, our website is really great. We have a whole, it's a little, it's going to be redone, so you have to dig around a little bit, but we do have an entire library section, which links to scientific studies, articles in the press, um, you know, beautiful writings and poetry, like a whole gamut of different kinds of things you can look at for that type of thing. Um, I, you know, I would second the, <laughs> the keynote speaker's message about starting with the connection and the, the emotion. Um, Rewilding the Heart is a great book, in my opinion, for um, you know, just starting with that connection. Because I think you know, numbers and scientific facts sometimes don't, you know, don't really engage people as much. Um, but yeah, no, you're welcome to, to use anything there. I saw you. Yeah. Okay, well, I just had a question about the, the grades that mm -hmm. you mentioned, and I think you said you specified that it was like a certain amount for new acquisitions and then another amount for conservation easement purchases. Or do you just go into a little bit more detail about like, yeah. is it flexible between like, or you, I think we, we mentioned earlier, like, you could add a forever wild easement attachment to an existing easement, or would you hold the property fee and be applying to us to hold an easement? You know, like, is there any kind of? Sure, yeah, I can speak to that. So um, in either circumstance, a forever wild conservation easement would be held by Northeast Wilderness Trust, or, or um, if it was a private land that you were trying to conserve under a forever wild easement, we could co-hold an easement with a participating land trust. Um, but the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to support new acquisitions, um, we are just awarding a higher amount to support new acquisitions. And then if you have existing preserves, the award amount is one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So in both circumstances, they would be permanently protected under a forever wild easement. Right. Yeah. yeah, it mostly has to do with how the funding goes. Like, because mm -hmm. some some um, land trusts are using our grants to fund their stewardship. Uh, or different, you know, due diligence that they need to do, whether it's surveys or things like that. Um, but then the acquisition costs obviously add to that budget hugely. Yeah. Yeah. A question about the public policy in uh -huh. the, you know, for example, there's nationally the legacy forest. Mm -hmm. There is there there is no s it, similar forever wild which places a higher value on a non-working forest. And what are we doing in terms of public policy to economically incent, both with carbon or otherwise, mm -hmm. forever wild versus managed forests in order to change that ratio from the 20 to 1 in Connecticut, I think it was. Mm -hmm. What are people doing with reference to pressing the edge of the I don't know if you'd be a better one to policy. answer that than me. I, I'm not really engaged in policy so much. I do know that in Vermont um, recently, you know, we have our current use program, which I know most of the states have some version of that where you can enroll, landowners can enroll a property. Um, and in Vermont, if the landowner is keeping it in some current use, such as farming or um, timber, um, they can get a reduced uh, tax burden and um, so I know there has been uh, activity in Vermont to apply the same credit if a landowner is going to use you know their property for conservation reasons um, you know but I don't I don't I don't really know There, it depends on, well, so like with the partnership program or with, in general, our fee lands. Yeah, I mean, because they're from different land trusts, they're all, you know, all um, different ages of forests. And, and, and not just forests, they can be wetlands, forested wetlands. And, so 
So if, if uh, one of these easements or some of these easements are on um, middle age forest, this easement would not allow the landowner to do forest management to promote old growth characteristics? No, right. So we um, we don't manage. So um, an example, like I, I was in your session and um, loved it, by the way. <laughs> and it was beautiful. Um, so like the kind of practice where you're talking about like managing for habitat where you want some um, early succession forest for the warbler, you know, the different species there. So um, that doesn't happen on the properties that we conserve as forever wild because the natural disturbances we're hoping to get are, you know, beavers and even these aging, like eventually if you take the long view, these old forests, well, these trees are gonna die, right? And, yeah. and so then those the gaps in the canopy and the multi-age will evolve, but it's not as quick as what you're talking about. Right. So, like, my concern is that um, you know, if we need to create these characteristic structures in the forest, our right. species don't live that long to wait for it to happen. Right. So, some of the land trusts that we've worked with, um, they do these kind of projects. So we're not asking them to commit to Forever Wild on all of their properties. So they're looking at places where they have, um, where they're doing some management, and they don't put those under easement. And even if they're on the same property, they'll, they'll cut out areas where they have a golden wing warbler program that they're working with. So it's not, um, it's not that the idea is to like cover the whole landscape this way. Um, so land trust will look at that and will do different kinds of activities because there's a some of that has its place, right? Um, and I think um, in the rewilding community, there's an idea that it's important to have some wildlands set aside, almost as like a baseline to compare to because we've done a lot of human management, um, always thinking we know what is best, and we're not always right. And we also don't really know what nature will do with that space unless there's some areas where nature is unimpeded. So it's kind of like you have forever <laughs> wild areas, you have managed areas, you have you know areas that are for more resource extraction. So I don't really know who was. I haven't been watching. Yeah. Um, Wait. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, going to add to that. So um, the easement you Well, it would just depend, like, they would be doing their, their, their warbler project. I don't, I don't know, I'm not involved with those. Yeah, but. like, not within our, our conservation area. Right. If, if, um, you know, if it grows up now, it's getting to go in the warblers, you know, and you don't have another place ready for them, mm -hmm. at the same place, and then they get out there. Right, so right. I think that the members just should be aware that this would prevent them mm -hmm. from Right, 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 it definitely does. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, what happens over time, you know, like what's going to happen where we're managing it and where we're letting mm -hmm. natural forces manage it and create those disturbance areas. But just it's a. Sorry, it's yeah, the trails, um, usually we try to just have a balance so that it's primarily for nature, but humans can get through. So we don't do like dense trail networks like you'd have in like a mountain bike area or like an all hiking area or something like that. So it's limited. Um, but they usually um, talk to us, you know, the land trust we worked with in Connecticut talked about, well, we wanted to have a trail connector to the Mohawk and we want to do this and, do that. and, they, and they put those things, you know, in there. You mentioned allowing for natural disturbances. Um, what about fire as a natural disturbance? Let's say lightning strikes in the middle of a land trust property. You're just going to let that burn to the edges of the property before it can be fought? Uh, no, no. The land trust can can fight fires. Yep, that's a reserved right, and it's a safety right. Like even if you didn't give that permission, the, the, <laughs> your fire department's going to come in and put out the 
fire anyway, <laughs> like whatever your easement says. But then, uh, you know, a lot of the, like the northeast forests are a little bit different than the forests out west where we naturally get this, um, we have areas that are subject to fire, like where some of the pine barrens have been and things, but we have this very mossy, wet, dense, like our undergrowth is a little bit different um, than what you get out west with that like fire succession ecosystems. Is there a minimum parcel size that, um, that should be? Um, we're to your target. Well, I mean, we we look for larger, but like, so if we're we're aiming like for five hundred, as you know, in this area, whereas in like Maine and New Hampshire, we're probably looking for closer to a thousand acres as a starting point. Yes, although we have worked with land trusts, like you saw how Salisbury had several parcels that are not connected, but their their plan is, you know, they're looking at con kind of connecting out that area, um, you know, with different different properties. So it depends a lot on the context. So like Caitlin highlighted the one with Cornwall, where it was a smaller piece, but it was helping connect their land trust land to the Mohawk State Forest. And so that conservation context is a lot bigger than, so we kind of do an analysis on with the whole context yeah, and, and whether you're part of a forest And block. like I was saying, we recognize that, you know, we work in Maine and Connecticut, two different states with two different stories going on there. So like we, we understand that the parcel size is lower here. So I would just encourage anybody to apply and we'll do, we'll do the analysis. Of what's going on. You mentioned really quickly that there was a um, carbon piece that could be added to the, for additional money. Um, can you explain that further? Like right. Sure. The sure. Yes. Yeah. So we have developed a carbon program for land trusts. Um, which the requirement for entry into that is a forever wild easement. So there has to be a change in the restricted, you know, timber harvest on the property. And um, my card there is that's the you want to call me and talk about that if you're interested in that. But that's like an optional piece. So if you do Wildlands Partnership Program, there's an opportunity, but it's not necessarily part of your so grant award. You investigate the larger carbon network, a carbon marketing trade-off network. No, we built our own. We built our own program. Yeah, just for wildlands. It's the only carbon program that's for wildlands as opposed to managed woodlands. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.